Well, it's good to be here today and tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the Sea Turtle Center and see what you guys are doing up here. So I had a nice time this morning. And um, so that's basically what I'm going to talk about, a little bit about how the Sea Turtle Center started. Um, we, at St. Catharines Island, my, um, I've been working there since 1989 in different capacities, part-time and eventually full-time. And we developed a, in 2000, developed a um, wildlife health program for native wildlife in Georgia. And these are the various species that we started working with and have continued to work with, and now this has kind of expanded into the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. So it's not just sea turtles that we're working with. We're developing programs for a number of native wildlife species, mostly threatened, endangered, or species of concern for the state of Georgia. Um, and this type of work um, uh, can create awareness and lead to more extensive conservation programs, and that's how the Georgia Sea Turtle Center evolved. And so wanted to go through a little bit about how it evolved in through this wildlife health program. We started to, I was employed by the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is a, was associated with St. Catharines at the time. And so their field vet program had a program with sea turtles trying to standardize health related issues with sea turtles in a number of different countries and they weren't working in the US. So we decided to do uh, use St. Catharines Island Connections and do a project in Georgia, which included included looking at all the life stages of sea turtles from a health perspective, and that included looking at stranded turtles that were coming in the Georgia coast. And at the time, we could uh, do the diagnostic, same diagnostics we were doing for this study on the stranded turtles. And then DNR had a little Rubbermaid tub that we used, and we dumped and fill, dump and fill system where we had, had it on rollers and rolled it to the dock and put salt water in it and um, rolled it back so we could keep turtles like that for a couple days, but then they would have to be shipped out to Florida or South Carolina or North Carolina, and it was, um, that's what kind of stimulated me to start looking at the uh, program in Georgia for rehabilitation and health and education for sea turtles, and that started in 2001 is when we started trying to fundraise for the project. And so the fundraising initially was uh, a little inventive. Initially, the, the, the rehab center was going to be on St. Catharines, where I worked at the time. And so one of the fundraising projects we did was called the Turtle Crawl, which was a, um, a broken triathlon. And this was one of my colleagues, um, Barb Wolf, who's a veterinarian that came down for it. And she really got into, the, into it, actually put on a shell. Um, we had other various, I, I was mostly doing all the fundraising and everything, and obviously that was pretty difficult to raise a lot of money trying to do veterinary work and um, fundraise. And this was our, one of our many original designs, and obviously it's evolved significantly since that time. So in 2003, we elected to um, move the center to Jekyll Island, where we were trying to develop some education programs, but it really made sense that we needed to connect the two, and there needed to be a strong um, education and public outreach program through through this uh, um, idea that we were developing. So we formed a partnership with a number of organizations, primarily the Jekyll Island Authority and Foundation. The foundation is the fundraising arm of the authority. And St. Catharines Island Foundation at the time, Wildlife Conservation Study, which was my employer and the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And then through all this, Georgia Aquarium has been involved from helping with some of the design phase, um, giving us advice, to um, providing some grants. And then also, of course, you've heard of Dylan and Joey, and we've been involved with uh, some collaborative efforts through those turtles. And so the objectives of the center are was and, and is still to provide veterinary care and long-term rehabilitation for injured and ill sea turtles in Georgia, but also in other states. We see a lot from Florida. We just got some turtles in from North Carolina, a cold stunning event recently. And we've also got turtles from New England. Um, and it's not just sea turtles. We do all native Chelonians are all native turtles. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Also to educate the general public about the sea turtle and other turtles, their life history, but also the plight of the turtle and also about what we do. Um, and then um, training programs for um, veterinarians, biologists, graduate students, both in the US but also internationally. So we have some international programs that we've developed. And then research focusing on health and disease, but also other areas. Um, and then there was a historic preservation component. If you haven't seen the Sea Turtle Center, it's in a historic power plant. So that was actually restored, which is one 
one of the mandates of Jekyll Island is to restore some of these old buildings. So it's a really unique building um, and it's a really neat contrast with the actual Sea Turtle Center, but you also have this other component which attracted other, that attracts other people from a different, you know, from the historic aspects. So it's kind of neat from that point. So we do have a website if you're interested in learning more. It's a good website and there's a blog, so we do update that regularly. Um, so you can go to that. And we did open our doors in 2000, June 2007, so it took about six years to, from the, you know, the, my initial interest in doing this to actually having it happen, which was really cool to have something that was kind of a dream and you think about and you're not sure if it's really gonna happen and you're kind of doing the fundraising and then people just start getting excited about it and it actually did happen and it's actually um, a lot more than I thought it would be. So it's really exciting to see something like that happen. So we have um, had uh, successfully released, rehabilitated and released 18 turtles so far, and we have 12 sea turtle, the sea turtle patients, um, and then 12 sea turtle patients that are currently um, at the center. We've had others that have not made it or that we've had to euthanize, um, but that's the ones that we've been successful with. Um, we have a big program, Diamondback Terrapins. If there's time, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, but we've actually treated 256 Diamondback Terrapins and with uh, 69 that have been released. And terrapins are another local species. They're on, the only um, uh, brackish water marsh turtle in North America. So they're also a very significant animal and in a lot of trouble, um, just like sea turtles. Um, and a lot of people get confused. They, they think the turtles, what they do is they come up to nest on the causeway and they get hit. And a lot of people think those are sea turtles. So there's an important educational component too that uh, to let people know those are not sea turtles and there's something different. Um, we, in one year in 2007, we documented 300 terrapins being hit on the causeway. So it's a, those are all nesting females. So it's a significant impact on the population. And last year we had similar numbers. So we'll talk, hopefully talk a little bit about our conservation programs for terrapins. We've also seen 52 other uh, turtles through rehab, um, freshwater turtles and land turtles. And the staff is really the key to our success. I'm sure you all know here that um, the staff is just really important. We have a, a great rehabilitation staff, education staff, um, and we also have internships. We have a, um, a one person that's doing our um, uh, saturation tagging program and, and on loggerheads that come up on the beach at Jekyll. And um, then a great volunteer program. We have a gift shop. Um, so all those things are really important to have that core staff um, to really make things happen. And um, if you haven't been to the Sea Turtle Center, it's, uh, this is the education facility. The gift shop has the big Arculum, which is a prehistoric turtle, um, the life-size um, model of the, um, uh, of the Arculon, so that's pretty neat. And uh, um, we've done very well with our gift shop. And then as you go through the education facilities, it's very interactive. People are really engaged by, by what they see. And we have a window that was actually um, one of the last things we thought of, but it's just been a, an amazing um, way to educate people, but a window that looks into the hospital so people can see everything we do. We can talk to people about, uh, we have a turtle on the table that we're treating. We can tell them about what happened to the turtle, but also the life history of the turtle, uh, the conservation impacts. If it's a boat strike, we can talk about, you know, 20% of the the cases we see are boat strike injuries, or 20% of the strandings are boat strike, and it's not just sea turtles, it's marine mammals, it's you know manatees, and it's a huge issue. And, and then people see the turtle, you know, and they really get engaged with that turtle, but it just makes a big impact on their mind that they're, they're actually seeing these animals. And this is just a surgery. We did a skull fracture repair on a turtle, and we had an orthopedic team. A we use a local hospitals, just like I'm sure you do here, and they donated the um, orthopedic apparatus that we used for the skull repair, and, uh, and that's just uh, the whole team in there, and people can actually watch what we're doing. And then as you, um, so you go through the education area, and then you go through, get into the area where the um, rehabilitation cases are kept, and these are our tanks over here, and there's an elevated walkway so the guests can come into that elevated walkway and there's books all about each patient and the, the medical records so people can read through the medical records and um, there's educators that do programs um, every 
hour and we have a patient update so they'll go through each case with with the public and tell them what's going on and answer questions um, and so it's uh, pretty much everything we're doing everybody can see and it is a the facilities are great we were really able to get the we were able when we did the initial fundraising make sure that all the equipment we needed were was in that initial package and we did get a lot of uh, you know I've been collecting um, equipment along the way um, since I had six years to develop this so um, the um, we're able to do most things right at the center um, but we'll talk about a little bit about what happens when a turtle comes to the center it's a lot of you are animal husbandry people and veterinarians so you know a lot of this stuff but just to give you an idea of what we do um, when a turtle first comes in of course we um, try to look at it first without actually handling it just because it's the, the behavior will change once you start manipulating the animal. And then we do a thorough physical uh, morphometric measurements and uh, body weight. And sometimes that can be challenging depending on the size of the turtle. Um, but you can see over there, we do have some other scales um, that uh, um, allow us to weigh bigger turtles. And then we can do a lot of our own in-house diagnostics. Um, so these are things that we would um, do when the turtle first comes in. Uh, the pack cell volume, total solids, and glucose are kind of like your first initial parameters that you can get done in five minutes and make a lot of judgments on how to go with that particular case and give you a prognosis. Um, but we can also do more extensive diagnostics. Um, we do have a digital x-ray and ultrasound machine, so it's uh, been really nice to, to have that technology and we can, uh, with a digital x-ray, we can, it goes right to the computer and you guys have a one here, but it's uh, um, nice because you can share those images with uh, other professionals, with radiologists that are, you know, looking at x-rays all day. This is, uh, so with the bigger sea turtles, we have to do four different films to get the whole turtle on one, um, on one, uh, to get the whole turtle just for one view. So that's the DD view. You can see that this one was given some barium or a dye to see what its GI tract motility was doing. And then here is the line of the lung. And it turns out that this turtle had um, four liters of air in its sloma cavity. And that's one of the things we see um, pretty commonly is what we call floaters. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for flotation abnormalities in sea turtles. One of the most common ones we see are, is air in their body cavity. So they, they just have um, one body cavity. They don't have a thorax and abdomen because they lack a diaphragm. And so when they get air in their, when they get a ruptured lung, it's going to go into that whole body cavity. It's not like a human where you get uh, pneumothorax and it's uh, extreme emergency. They can still live with it and do okay other than they can't dive. Um, so this particular animal's name was Spitfire, and it wasn't defecating very well either, so that's why we had done the barium series. But once we got that four liters of air off, we didn't have to go back in. Sometimes you will have to re-aspirate air. Um, we can stick a needle right into the, in front of the back leg, and that goes right into the body cavity, and we can just aspirate that air off. And once we got the air off, all the problems went away. It started defecating normally, um, and obviously be, started eat, well, she was eating okay prior to that and uh, um, obviously was no longer a floater. Some of the other causes of flotation abnormalities would be pneumonia because a lot of times we'll get asymmetric. Uh, one lung will be what we call emphysematous. The other lung will be more consolidated and they'll float asymmetrically. And then sometimes with just gas in the GI tract for a variety of reasons, um, you may get an animal that floats. And there are other reasons, but those are the most common. We do have flexible endoscopes. We can do what's called bronchoscopy where you can actually stick the scope down into the um, trachea into the lung and take biopsies and look at the lung. And we've done that on a couple of occasions so far. And then uh, larger scopes that we can actually do upper and lower GI tract evaluations and cloacal exams as you would do for the fish here. And, uh, um, and we do have a rigid laparoscope. So the difference between a flexible Flexible endoscopy is where you can actually, that, that is a flexible scope, whereas the rigid scopes are, are like a telescope and you're actually inserting that into the body cavity and that can be used for um, diagnosing various problems, also doing a thorough exam because these guys have a shell on them, so really assessing whether that turtle is ready for release and healthy, the best way to do it is actually to visualize the um, body organs and if you have a problem a lot of times you can diagnose it by taking a, a piece of tissue like if you have uh, elevated liver values on your chemistry panel you might want to go in and take a, a biopsy to see what 
actual problem there is in the liver. Um, so that's what we would use that for. And you can also use it in some situations for surgery. You can stick, uh, um, you can suture up, like there has been cases uh, um, where the lung has actually been sutured through a laparoscope when there's a little lung tear. So you don't actually have to open up the animal. And you've probably heard it with humans, surgeries. I have my um, appendix removed through a laparoscope. So you can actually do major surgeries now through laparoscopy and we're starting to um, evaluate that, those te that technology for turtles as well. Um, we do work with the local community again. We're able to do CT scans and MRIs on, on turtles. So when we have that need, we can, we've been able to set up some arrangements with our local hospitals. And just some of the things we do for therapy, just a brief summary, because we don't have a lot of time to go through everything, but um, when a turtle first comes in, we're typically gonna dry dock it. We're not gonna put it in water right away, because a lot of times they're too weak to go into water. So we need to get their, their fluid therapy going. We need to get um, them rehydrated. We need to get uh, their glucose levels up, get their blood work started. Um, and then once they're a little bit, when they're ready to go in water, a lot of times we'll put them in fresh water first, and that um, is good for a couple reasons. They will drink the fresh water, and it's also absorbed through their cloaca. Um, so turtles have a different type of bladder than people do. The, um, from the kidney, the ureter comes off the kidney and goes right into the cloaca, and then the urethra will come off the cloaca into the bladder, so there's no connection between the kidney and the bladder, and the bladder can actually absorb fluid and electrolytes. So in, say, something like a gopher tortoise, the, half the sloma cavity would be, could be potentially encompassed by the bladder if it's full, where sea turtle bladders are pretty small because they don't really need to store water, but they can absorb water, fresh water through the cloaca into the bladder and then get rehydrated that way. So um, that's one reason to use the fresh water. The other reason is we do, um, these animals, especially the loggerheads, come in with uh, epibiota. We call it epibiota, but they, a normal loggerhead has um, 80, there was a study done on Wasa Island where they found 80 different epibionts, or well, epibionts on their shell, which include barnacles, but also um, a variety of other species. And uh, um, sometimes when they get sick, those species will change to things like leeches and things that are gonna compromise the animal. So the freshwater soaks help get those, kill the, the leeches and help loosen up the barnacles. Um, so it serves two purposes. And then fluid therapy is, usually these animals are dehydrated, so we're gonna pick some form of fluid therapy and we have to base that on whether the animal's anemic, if it has low protein, which is pretty common, we'll, you can easily overhydrate those animals. So sometimes we'll go to um, doing blood transfusions or using artificial blood blood, or we're, we recently had a case, um, her name's Pumpkin. Um, she came in around Halloween, but she was actually from Pumpkin Creek, so that was really why she was named that. But she had a pack cell volume of five, and in normal, it was probably around 30. And she was very weak, and she had a lot, of, she was what we call a debilitated turtle, had all these barnacles all over. And we elected to go ahead and use um, Procrit, which is a drug that is um, uh, used for anti, uh, for cancer patients that are anemic. And, and with these debilitated turtles, we've done, we did a whole study on them, um, looking at, uh, we did 20 necropsies on debilitated turtles over two years, and all those turtles 100% had bone marrow suppression. So we know that's the reason for the anemia. So we wanted something that would stimulate the bone marrow, and the Procrit actually did work. Um, it is very expensive, so it's about $125 per treatment, and initially we were doing that every day. So we were able to um, get some donations to help us with the uh, pay for the treatment. We also put her, that same animal on iron, so if they're anemic, iron supplementation is something we'll often do. Um, nutritional support is really important. You can see this animal being tube fed. and. Um, so right now, what we've done initially, where we're using uh, Ensure and uh, fish and squid mixed up into a sh milkshake, call it a squid milkshake. Um, but now we're working with uh, Missouri, which is a nutrition company, to develop a uh, diet specifically for sea turtles, especially the different stages. So when they first come in, if they're really debilitated, they're probably depleted in a lot of the nutrients, and so that initial diet would be something that's very easily absorbed. Um, and then as they move, as they improve in, if you're still tube feeding, have another uh, um, diet that would be more appropriate for something that's further along in their treatment. Um, but we're looking at um, nutritional status of 
healthy loggerheads in the wild in the different live stages. So nesting females that come up on Jekyll, we're looking at those animals. We're um, going out on the Georgia Bulldog, which is a research vessel that studies sea turtles and collecting samples from subadults and males. Um, so we're trying to look at what is normal, analyzing horseshoe crabs and blue crabs, which is our main diet, and whelks to see what uh, nutrients those have to try to come up with a, a better diet for sea turtles and hopefully also work on uh, vitamin supplementation because right now we're using a bird vitamin supplement. There's not a, a specific vitamin for sea turtles. So that's some of the research that we're doing. Um, oftentimes these animals go on antifungal treatments and um, antibiotics and we usually do a blood culture before we start anything so we know if that animal does have, if we do culture a bacteria, we know specifically what we need to treat with, but we'll start them on a, a couple drugs that we use typically um, in sea turtles. Um, we also use a lot of what we call GI motility stimulants, uh, which are uh, turtles when they get sick, their GI tract basically shuts down. One of the things we see oftentimes is their prey items will accumulate in their GI tract or the parts of the prey items, so the chitin and the shell parts will accumulate and form a big mass um, and cause an obstruction, but those can be relieved with mineral oil and starting them on GI motility stimulants. And we're often looking at, we're real excited when a turtle poops and we're always, what's the poop look like today? So that's something we often look at. And then wound care, as you have here, I think wound care is a big part of your, your um, medical, a lot of the things, cases you see are trauma and things like that. So your veterinarians have a lot of unique ways of dealing with wounds and we've dealt with, we, we do the same. And so um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about wound care, but these are the common things that we see, boat strikes. It says, I said earlier, 20% of the cases we see are boat strikes, 20% um, of the stranding, so um, a lot of those don't make it. A lot of them are very severe. Um, and another big thing is uh, that's gone down a lot since the shrimp fleet has been uh, decreased in Georgia is drowning in, in shrimp nets. And of course, the TED turtle excluder device has helped with that, but uh, we're actually finding that the decrease in the fleet is actually what's seems to be causing a significant decrease in the stranding rate in Georgia. Um, in non c patients, hit by car is definitely the highest um, cause of mortality and, and also reasons we see turtles. Um, buoyancy issues we talked about, the debilitated turtles are pretty common. We do see cold stunning cases, which is where um, the sea turtle gets into cold water, usually under 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, is when it will occur. And obviously we don't see a lot of that in Georgia, but we'll get turtles from other states coming in for us to help with, because a lot of times those situations are what we call a mass mortality event where a lot of turtles strand at one time. Like in North Carolina, the Karen Beasley uh, Sea Turtle Rehabilitation Center got 30 green turtles in at one time, and there was a bunch of other turtles that they needed help with, so we took three, uh, two loggerheads and a green to take some load off, off of them. Um, and then spirochotrematodes are a type, it's a flatworm that um, is very common in sea turtles. Normal sea turtles have them, but when they get sick, um, they'll get more. And the, the most common, there's a lot of different types. The most common one lives in the heart of the sea turtle and they shower their eggs into the capillaries and the, their eggs get lodged in tissues. And so um, that causes a foreign body response in that tissue. So if you get a lot of those eggs building up, which these debilitated turtles, what we found is the spark or trematodes are causing a lot of the reason they're sick. So we're gonna go ahead and treat for those trematodes. Um, you don't get rid of the eggs, but you'll, get rid you'll decrease the load. And when we treat for parasites, since we're um, rehabilitating these animals to be released, we take a little different um, way to approach it. We're not trying to totally rid them of the parasites. We're just trying to decrease the load to make them better, but we still want them to have that normal immunity. So we're not totally trying to get rid of parasites, but we're trying to get those turtles so they're feeling better, they're in better shape so they can handle those kind of things back in the wild. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about wound care because we I thought these, this would be something I could share with you because we have had some um, successes that are pretty interesting. And so just some basic principles of wound care. Typically, you're not going to close wounds that we see because most of the time these turtles have been out for a long time and their wounds are infected. So we're not just going to go and suture up a skin, skin wound that's infected. And healing can take months to even a year for some of these I injuries. So um, the typical case is going to take close to a year. So when we take a turtle in, it's going to be a pretty big commitment. 
and we do heavy debridement um, initially. If there's a lot of debris in there, you want to get all that dead tissue out. So that's called debridement. And then um, what we're looking for is this nice, healthy granulation tissue. So that's, that red tissue is good. Even though it might look nasty, it's, that's actually good, healthy tissue. And a lot of times we'll take pieces of the particular bone if we think there's an infection and submit it for the pathologist to look at so that we're actually, because a lot of things, if you just try to submit a culture, you may not culture a fungus out, but there may be a fungal infection in there. So getting your histopath done is a really important part of the whole process of treating these wounds and culturing. So we want to take a the tissue and actually culture it if we think there's an infection, infection there so we can get sensitivities and know which antibiotic to use. Um, and again, all the things that the husbandry is really critical and it's probably one of the most important things is the, the staff that we have, that they're very observant that, and they're dedicated to what they're doing, but good nutrition is really a big key. Once these animals start eating, getting on a good plane of nutrition, you see a huge, just an amazing increase in the healing process. So once they're starting to get on a good plane of nutrition, their body weight's getting up, their, start, their immune system's better. Um, water quality, of course, is really important too because these animals are obviously in water. And then reducing stress, you always want to try to handle, minimize handling, but you do have to do some handling. So it's all kind of a balancing act. We do use a lot of silver products. Silver is a um, uh, antimicrobial, it's antifungal and antibacterial, and it's used a lot in burn victims. Um, and these are different products that are available. There's a gel, there's the cream, and um, this is actually a mesh that you put sterile water on and it will give you 72 hours of slow release silver. And then this mesh is a similar product where you get a slow release of silver. And all these are developed for burn victims and we're using them a lot in sea turtles. This is not a sea turtle, obviously. This is a tortoise from St. Catharines Island. They used to have a, a large collection of Madagascarian tortoises. This is a radiated tortoise that got a pine cone stuck up in its inguinal region and um, developed this very large wound on its knee and joint fluid is actually coming out of that. And so um, that's a really hard place to put a bandage on. So we actually put um, suture loops all the way around. So you can see a little loop there, but that's, they're all the way around the wound. We put the silver on top and then gauze, and then we used a shoelace-like uh, material to shoelace the um, bandage in place. And that was very successful. We use that in sea turtles too. So we, um, this is actually not a sea turtle. This is a soft shell turtle that came in with hit by car and the leg was uh, um, basically mangled from the hit by car. So we had to amputate it. And it required several surgeries because it kept getting infected and kept tissue kept dying off. So this is what we call debridement. And actually by the end, we were all the way up into the hip area and we couldn't even close the wound. So we had this open wound that we had to deal with. And we used the tri-side ointment that they're using here from Brand Ritchie from University of Georgia has developed it. And it's a really nice product for aquatic species because it stays on for long periods of time. But you can see the wound um, pretty much totally healed up. And that's when we ended up releasing the animal. But um, Cruella DeVille is still at the center. She was a cold stunned turtle and she developed a very unusual um, bacterial infection of her, the lining of her shell, which is keratin, the scutes, and then underneath the bone. And so it's called osteomyelitis is the bone infection. And we did biopsies, as I said, that's good to do. And it turned out to be a bacterial infection. We cultured a bunch of bacteria that were all sensitive to a drug called amikacin. We tried a lot of different things to treat this. And you can see how severe it was after the debridement. These are really bad wounds. And I, I was really worried about her. I didn't know if it was going to heal up. So we, I wanted to try to bone cement, but it's really expensive. It's like $1,500 for this five mil amount of bone cement. And so we got with the orthopedic surgeon that had helped us with the other turtle with the, the skull surgery. And he was able to find some outdated um, bone cement. And so that was a lot cheaper because it was free. And um, we mixed the amicacin in with that. And we put it right on the wounds. And the nice thing about that is it gives you slow release of antibiotics. So it's like 30 days of antibiotics and we don't have to mess with the wound. And we debrided it. After 30 days, we took it off. And it was really healing. This was, we were starting to get some scarring around here and it's looking a lot better. So we were really excited and we got some more. And by the end, you know, this took a few months, but by the end the t shell now is totally healed up. And of course, when we got it totally healed up, she fractured her humerus. So that was just a whole other thing we had to deal with. But luckily it was very well aligned and we've been able to deal with that just by not manipulating her a lot. And since her shell was healed up, it's done very well. 
And I think that's a pretty common problem in young greens. They're really flighty. They're doing this. And you know, no matter how you try to restrain them, sometimes that's going to happen. So it's just something to be aware of if you're working with little green turtles. They're just maniacs, spaz, spazos. Um, another thing we've seen in our Kemp's release, and I think we've had five cases in Kemp's, is this marginal scute osteomyelitis, another bone infection. It was bacteria. And interestingly, these bacteria are all sensitive to doxycycline in every case, which isn't a drug I typically use in turtles. But um, there's a product called Doxyrobe that's used for dental work in dogs. And you, if you take a tooth out and you have an infection there, you can put this in. It's like a, almost like an epoxy gel that you can line the wound with. And we did sort of the same thing where we'd put that on. We put bone wax, which is like uh, beeswax, sterile beeswax, and then, um, and then put uh, uh, a waterproof bandage called Tegaderm, and then waterproof tape, and then super glue. We use a lot of super glue on our patients. We could buy out the super glue company. And this is what it looked at the end it healed up. It took a long time, but it did eventually heal up and you can barely tell that there was those wounds there anymore. So, so another thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, the use of honey and honeycomb. And uh, I had used honey on um, other species and we were trying to use honey on this deep propeller wound and one of my interns, um, um, family has a, is our beekeepers and she said, well, why not try the comb to try to pack the wound? And so we ended up doing that with Duffy um, and these are the properties of why honey is um, effective. So we'll go through each of those properties. So I thought you might be interested in this. Um, and I'm giving a talk to the beekeeper. Well, I already gave one talk to the beekeeper um, uh, association because they were on Jekyllon and they invited me to present at their conference. Um, so they're pretty psyched about it. And they've been actually providing us with honey and honeycomb. So we've got the whole local beekeeping community interested in the sea turtles now. But it's very hyperosmotic. It's, um, so that means that you know, since it's got a high sugar content, it can pull material out of the wound. So that's one of the benefits of it. And that, what that does also is um, kills the bacterium fungi by drawing water out of the, the cell of the, of the organism. And um, so we're going to look at Duffy. This is what Duffy's wound looked like when she came in. It was a huge wound, um, that cut, a propeller that cut through the um, top of the shell, the carapace, the bridge, which is this part in the plastron. And then uh, this wound here was part of that same wound that the slice had come down, had cut the upper part of the leg, so the bone, the femur, and a huge defect there. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know what we were going to do, but we ended up using honey. Um, and so we, again, debrided the wound. You remember what that means. And the acidity of the honey, honey has got a pH of four, which also kills a lot of uh, the bad organisms. And then the main antimicrobial component is hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide um, kills bacteria on contact. And the way it works is that honey is about 30% glucose, and then a smaller component is glucose oxidase. And that's an enzyme that's found in the dige digestive system of, um, of the bee, and they get it from the nectar. That enzyme is actually activated by um, the, uh, the tissue. Um, when, it's, when the honey gets in contact with tissue, the pH goes up to about 6. That activates the enzyme. And then the, the sodium in the tissue also activates the enzyme. And that's where you get that hydrogen peroxide production. And it's a slow release of hydrogen peroxide. Um, so some of the other properties are the medicinal properties of honey vary. Um, depending on the type of honey. The Manuka honey from New Zealand is supposed to be exceptionally effective, but the beekeepers I talked to said it's not, not as good as they say. Um, but some honeys have nectars that actually inhibit the production of hydrogen peroxide, um, whereas some honeys have different nectars that we don't even know why they're more effective, but they have, the nectars have certain antimicrobial properties. Some have flavonoids. Um, that contribute to the antibacterial properties. And then different flowers sources have different antioxidant capabilities. Um, it also enhances the immune system. It's anti-inflammatory. It stimulates cell growth. Has the different types of honey have different antioxidant activities. The brown honey seem to be more um, effective. There's a, in New Zealand, honey is used, and in this, in this country, honey is used, um, there's medicinal grade honey where it's actually used in hospitals. And um, one of the examples is for di diabetic patients that have um, wounds that won't heal. And honey 
tends to, to work very effectively. So there's the unique Manuka factor that is like the stand, gold standard to measure the medicinal property of the honey. You can irradiate honey to get rid of the botulism spores. That's why you don't feed honey to infants is because of the botulism. And so the honeycomb also played a big role. And the nice thing about this is it's something we can really pack that wound in and we can actually saturate it with the, with the honey. Um, and so that this is just showing you um, um, packing Duffy's wound. Now we're just changing the bandage once every, or changing the wound um, once every two weeks. And now we have to anesthetize Duffy because um, she's gotten crazy. Uh, but you can see the wound, this is like early December. It's even better now, but it's, total, it's healing up very nicely. And she's actually formed a false joint um, for that femur, the area where the femur got cut. Um, another thing we're using is vacuum assisted wound care, which is kind of interesting. It's basically provide, creating a negative pressure on the wound. Um, this will remove bacterial contamination, reduce bacterial colonization, remove fluid from the wound. It increases blood flow and perfusion to the wound and promotes that healthy tissue I was talking about. We, we see turtles with, um, you can see their lung, um, really severe wounds. This is one, this is a common snapper. You can see how the, the apparatus is put on. There's a sponge here and um, there's a silver under that. We put a, that silver mesh material underneath that and then you have to get it so it's totally sealed up, which is the hard part. Um, but the nice thing about it is you can get to the point where you're only changing bandages every five days. Um, it's less painful because of that. The wounds heal very, very rapidly. It's amazing to see these wounds. We were able to work with the company. This is used in human medicine and they were able to donate the vac machine, which has a battery in it so we can stick a gopher tortoise outside, let it graze and still be on the vac. So it's really cool. And you can see how it's applied. Um, we have to use that tegaderm sticky bandage to get it so as it's sucking there's no leaks. And this is what it looks like. Um, so those are $25,000 machines and the company donated or put them on permanent loan. This was Dusty who initially had, you could see the lung through this wound. And this is actually where it's been healed up, but it's a, an aquatic species. In aquatic species, we have to be inventive and we'll put them on the vac for, for 12 hours and then we'll clamp it off and let them go in water and feed and stuff. So we'll kind of do a, do a um, give them time to, to eat and be a normal turtle. But this is uh, what you want to get. So you get this hard scar tissue and that, that's basically what ends up uh, occurring. We tried a lot of different things. We had this turtle in for over a year and eventually it did um, heal up. This is a common snapper and you can see the final wound is pretty much um, just scar tissue and that eventually would heal further out in the wild. So that's really the wound care part of it. Um, as you know with Dylan and Joey and we've released every loggerhead that we've had the opportunity we've released with the uh, satellite on it. So that's meshing education, but also gives us information on how these turtles are actually doing. Um, this was our first release. Um, and this was Golden Boy. And Bev, I just thought I'd, she's this is a really cool case. She came, she was a referral to us from the Gulf World Aquarium. Um, they had this turtle for a year. She couldn't open her mouth. They had gotten it to the point where she could just barely open it and get a little piece of food in. Um, so they had deemed it unreleasable. She was sent up to us by the state of Florida. We did really aggressive physical therapy by using, these are yardsticks just covered with duct, duct tape and we just add more yardsticks as we went along. We'd do like 10 minute sessions a day and eventually she was able to feed on her own and she was eating live prey. We try to get these animals on. Um, crabs, blue crabs, and horseshoe crabs. We work with local, local fishermen to um, help us get natural prey items. And so we ended up uh, putting a satellite on her and taking her back to uh, the Panama City area on the Gulf. And um, we, really, we drove all the way down there. It was like eight hour drive, released her, drove all the way back. And then she ended up uh, going from um, that area all the way down the Gulf Coast, all the way up the east coast of Florida, all the way back to Jekyll Island. And there was another turtle that had been released that had a satellite on it, a male. So we think she made it there on Jekyll and just came back to say hello and thanks for all the food um, and the good physical therapy. And um, then she went back, she went back down the east coast of Florida and went to Cape Canaveral and we think she nested there and then we lost track of her. But uh, that was a pretty cool um, case. We are also doing 
Um, research on sea turtles, we've been involved with uh, actual live captures of leather, leatherbacks out in water captures um, with another group of researchers from New England Aquarium and University of New Hampshire. Um, we have programs going on in St. Kitts. I have a PhD student that I'm on her committee and um, she was a student of mine early on, um, Kimberly Stewart, and she's actually been able to de develop a um, monitoring network in St. Kitts for hawksbills and leatherbacks and she's doing her PhD on leatherback and hawksbill health. And she's also working with the local community. Um, they do still eat sea turtles there, so she's trying to educate, get the fishermen involved that actually eat the turtles and um, get them involved with the um, actual conservation of the turtles and it's made a huge difference. Talked to you about the debilitated turtle syndrome. We did see an increased incidence of this problem in 2003 and we initiated an effort to um, try to look at this disease more closely in 2004 and 2005. Um, so that was another research effort. And then we're also involved with mortality events. We had a mortality event in coastal Georgia and northeast Florida in 2006 where we had 100 um, I think it was 150 loggerheads strand in a fairly small area, which was a much higher. It was that was in a in a, about a month period, and these turtles um, are have a really slow heart rate. The heart rate is about four to eight beats per minute. Um, they come in in pretty good physical condition, so this is one that came in initially, and then as the stranding event went along, they started coming in with all this algae on them, and um, they. Uh, are basically comatose when they come in. Um, so there was a huge investigation of this. Um, we never figured out what it was. We had a meeting, we held a workshop at St. Catharines. Um, so it was basically the Georgia Sea Turtle Center heading up this, uh, this effort, but trying to get all the experts together to look at what was available. Um, there was another mortality event down in South Florida, and we thought it was a separate um, problem, but as we looked at the two events, we were able to determine that it looks like it's the same thing. We think it's probably a marine algal toxin that's causing this, and one that isn't uh, identifiable yet. There's um, the brevitoxin, which causes red tide. There's demolic acid and saxotoxin. Those are the most common uh, marine algal toxin events, and we think this is something different. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There's also we monitor turtles when they come in for fibropapilloma. This is a really severe case. We've only had a few cases in Georgia, but it did in 2004 and 2005, we did see some cases that it had never been seen in Georgia. It's more common in South Florida, Hawaii, um, but it's one of the, uh, it's basically an epidemic of, um, of this, these tumors in turtles, uh, sea turtles um, throughout the world. Um, and we don't really have a lot of time to go into it. It's, Part of the disease is a her caused by herpes virus, but it's more complex than that. We also do have a nest monitoring saturation tagging program on Jekyll Island, so that means every turtle that comes up, we tag, um, we get samples, we measure, um, and uh, this had been done years ago, but we kind of started this back up, and it's generating a lot of important information. We also use this as an education tool where we take people on turtle walks and hatch, you know, hatchling walks as the hatchlings are hatching out. So it's a good adjunct to our program. We hire six interns in the summertime. We also have several training programs for veterinary students from um, the U.S. as well as abroad. Um, veterinary technician uh, externships and um, veterinary training and Ph.D. programs and graduate student programs. We try to assist, at least work with the university and try to provide um, uh, a means for graduate students to do their, their various projects um, in conjunction with the university. We do, again, have some international programs going on. St. Kitts has kind of developed into a, a, a pretty formal relationship. Um, so we've sent staff over to St. Kitts last year to help with the leatherback um, monitoring and tagging and health assessments and the hawksbill in water studies. You can see this is actually a hawksbill in this picture. They actually snorkel and capture the turtles and bring them up for tagging. Um, and those hawksbills are spongivorous. I don't know if you know all the diets of turtles, but they're pretty cool. They just, as adults, they're feeding on about 95% sponges. So they're a really important part of the, the ecosystem. Um, and we, I was just at a meeting uh, last month in St. Kitts, uh, the Widecast meeting, which is the wider Caribbean um, conservation organization. And so we're getting more and more involved. We held a wor health-related workshop in Panama in 2006. We do EnviroVet 
which is a training program for veterinarians and vet students from all over the world, and that's in conjunction with St. Catharines Island and um, White Oak Conservation Center and UC Davis. So that's a multi-institutional collaboration, but it's a really neat program. And we did some work in Barbados as well. We have a lot of, uh, we have great educators, great education programs. If you go to our website, you can see a lot of things that we're doing, but uh, a lot of on-site education programs for the visitors as well as school, school groups come through, and our educators are very unique. And again, I, as I said, it's a very interactive environment. If you come to the center, you'll see there's a lot of, a lot of energy. And also outreach programs, so going into schools, um, we have school teacher program where they come for two one week periods and train school teachers about sea turtles and all, the, they get involved with all aspects of our programs. And the Diamondback Terrapin program I talked to you about a little bit, but this is a program where we actually have staff and volunteers go out during the nesting season, which is May to July, they're coming up um, the causeway because it's high ground where they will lay their eggs, but they don't know there's cars going across the causeway and they get hit. So there's a huge number of terrapins being hit, which is a humanitarian effort, but also it's, it's definitely affecting the population if you're getting 300 turtles hit every year. So we've done, we do rehab, but that's sort of a band-aid band band approach. We also extract eggs from the dead turtles, and we induce the live turtles with oxytocin, and we collect the eggs for incubation and hatching and then rearing those um, turtles, and we use for education as well as um, get kids involved with the releases. We've also developed some road signs, so during the nesting season, April, we'll start putting up the road signs. Um, we also developed this bumper sticker, Drive Slow, Fertile, fertile Turtles on the Go. Um, so doing a lot of outreach, we're working with DOT. Um, they were actually mowing during the nesting season and tilling the ground where the turtles were nesting and we were having all this effort of collecting the eggs and then they were probably ruining all these nests. So we were able to work with them to not do that anymore. We've gotten a lot of coverage, so we're getting a lot of the word out about terrapins, that they're important species. This is just uh, from 2007, but we're also doing uh, this last, in 2008 we did GPS to every every terrapin that we found on the causeway. So we have, and we also had two researchers do um, some nesting ecology work. So we know now where they're nesting, um, and we know where they're coming up in the hotspots. So this next year, we're trying to get a, a program going where we're um, putting artificial nesting areas up um, and then fencing to keep them from crossing the causeway and actually trying to do something about that, but do it in a research fashion initially so we can make sure that this is working. It's been done, done in other states, so we're, um, but the, the, the um, selective fencing has not really been done. It's usually a whole causeway, and the causeway is seven miles long in a marsh area, so that would be very difficult. We did do this uh, uh, pilot study with this, art this uh, artificial nesting mound with a raccoon-proof case cage, raccoons are a problem. They do dig up the, the eggs. So um, this was an, an, just a test run last year. Kirk Buhlman from Savannah River Ecology Lab had used this technique in wood turtles. So this is probably what we're gonna be using in the future. And this just shows the surveys. We had a, uh, you know, the, one of the universities in uh, North Florida come up and their students um, ran the causeways each month. Um, we also do uh, get a lot of birds in. We don't have a real program for birds right now, but we're um, developing, hopefully going to eventually develop a uh, marine bird uh, rehabilitation center, but that's a long way off, but we do see birds and we do triage the birds. Um, we are doing um, marine bird disease and health surveillance in Georgia, so it's a program that we've been developing for several years now, looking at um, marine bird um, <clears throat> issues. This is a, a gannet where they had swallowed a rope, so marine debris. Uh, had student do a PhD student that's working on pelican chick health um, in South Carolina and Georgia. Um, this is a greater shearwater. There was, there's been two or three mass mortality events in the last couple of years with this species. You can see that the tube nose, they're called tube noses. So that's uh, that adaptation for that species are very pelagic. And then the American oyster catcher, we've done six years of um, health related work with that species. We're also involved with Marine Mammal Stranding Program in Georgia and the right whale um, stranding network and also gopher tortoise um, conservation, which is a, another species that needs a lot of help. This year, 
I'm the co-chair of the Gopher Tortoise Council, and this year we held um, the um, annual meeting for the Gopher Tortoise Council. Um, that was the t-shirt that we made. It's a really neat t-shirt, and these are, there's actually uh, 150 species to 300 species of animals that live in the burrow of the Gopher Tortoise, and these are some of the commensals that live in, in the Gopher Tortoise burrow. Um, and it's, there's a lot of issues going on with gopher tortoises in the state of Georgia. Um, we also held a diamondback terrapin road mortality workshop. So we're trying to hold workshops and bring um, um, some of the researchers and uh, expertise to, to Jekyll Island. And that's all I had. So I don't know if there's...